Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to an exciting program on how Paris became the city of love. I'm Ron Brown, and I must say Paris is one of my favorite cities in the world. In fact, I'll be there in August for two weeks again. So it is an absolutely marvelous city. So let's get underway on discussing how Paris became the city of love. Now, when we think of cities, we think of New York as the Big Apple or as the Empire City. Moscow claims to be the third Rome. Rome is the eternal city. Jerusalem, the city of gold. Every city has a reputation. This reputation is built up over, sometimes in the case of Rome, centuries. And it really makes the city unique. So what we're going to do is find out how Paris earned this wonderful reputation as a city of love, and how Americans have viewed Paris over the centuries. Once again, the outline will start with the city of love, the reputation news, uh, Paris has. Then we'll go back to Washington Square as a new Jerusalem, which really um, had a very negative view of Paris. And what happened during the Civil War with all the millionaires flocking to Paris for luxuries? The Calvinist New Jerusalem of New York City under siege by Paris? And the battle that goes on. Is Paris a city of love or is it a city of decadence? You go into any bookstore, if there are a bookstore near you, uh, and you will see an entire row of books on Paris. Probably Paris, New York, Rome, Jerusalem have more books written about them than any other cities in the world. Here we see how the French invented love, assuming that the French did invent love, and that it is part of French and Paris culture. What French women know, as if the women of Paris have a particular insight into the world. Other books, Paris and Love, We'll always have Paris, a time for love in Paris, dream of Paris, from Paris with love. Other books on love and Paris, it's not love, it's just Paris. Again, French women don't get facelifts, so this must be something in the water in Paris. Paris was a woman. Paris, he said, one of those uh, cheap romance novels. Cities are named after Paris. Paris, Texas. I was in Buenos Aires recently and it's called with pride the Paris of South America. And did you know that French women don't get fat? So even the food in Paris must be amazing. And of course there's David McCulloch's great book, The Greater Journey, Americans in Paris the influence of Paris on French artistic and cultural life. I recently went online and said things to do in Paris that were romantic, and it's just a short list. The list went on to 40 or 50, but kissing underneath the Eiffel Tower, putting your names on a padlock and attaching it to the Pont des Arts and throwing away the key. That's the latest fashion in Paris for lovers. Get your character, uh, caricature drawn in Montmartre. Buy a baguette in a touristy street stand and eat it on a park bench. I was When I was in Paris a year ago for a month, I stayed in the 19th arrondissement in the north, and you'd sit around the canal, and people would come up with a bottle of wine, sit there, drink their wine with their glasses, and just watch the boats go by in the canal. Something you'd never do in New York. Open a bottle of wine in Central Park, you'd be in jail in uh, 10 minutes. But it's Paris where things like that are loved. Dine in a restaurant at the top of the Eiffel Tower. Take a night cruise on the Seine. These are wonderful, romantic things to do in Paris. In fact, the Pont des Arts, where lovers go, put a lock on has, and throw away the key. It has made the bridge so heavy that late at night they come by and they remove half of the locks because there's no room for more of them. So this is the Paris of love. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you saw Midnight in Paris. 
uh, the latest Woody Allen movie, which is absolutely fantastic. Where if you go with someone who you love, you will love them forever. If you go there alone, you will find someone to love. Paris, the city of love, the reputation that we all uh, have about Paris. But in the United States, Paris wasn't always the city of love. Paris was the city of sin for many people. Back in the 1830s, shortly after the independence of the United States, a group of fierce Presbyterians, Dutch Reformed, and Evangelical Episcopalians staked out a part of the city which is today Washington Square. All around it they built their stately brownstones, as we can see on the left along the north we still see a row of these buildings. And these fierce Calvinists were intent on transforming New York City into a new Jerusalem, actually in anticipation of the second coming, where from New York salvation to the world would flow. These were the descendants of the Dutch Reformed Christians, the Presbyterians and the Evangelical Episcopalians who staked out Washington Square as a new Jerusalem. Well, of course, once they had filled up Washington Square with their stately brownstones, they expanded up Fifth Avenue. Dominating Washington Square was the fiercely Protestant Washington Square Dutch Reformed Church. Now, remember, the Calvinists were the inspiration of the Dutch, of the Presbyterians. John Knox was a student of John Calvin in Geneva. Just a bit up Washington Square was First Presbyterian Church, which was so fiercely puritanical that they banned stained glass windows. They banned church organs. The architecture of Washington Square and Lower Fifth Avenue was austere. It was Calvinist. No decorations on the outside. We call this federal architecture today. Very few decorations. Look at the building on the right. Very severe windows. No ornamentations whatsoever. The stoop going up into a doorway with very few decorations. Even on the left, the Washington Square. Very severe. The most severe of the Greek columns. So Washington Square was really the incarnation of Max Weber's theories that Protestantism meant hard work, simplicity of living, rejection of ornamentation, the work ethic in action. In Washington Square you were arrested if you desecrated the Christian Sabbath because good Puritans, good Calvinists went to church for the morning service, had a brief lunch break, and were back to for the second service. Washington Square and Lower Fifth Avenue were blocked off by giant chains so that there would be no traffic. Anybody caught whistling or dancing or doing anything to desecrate the Sabbath would be arrested. So this was the fierce New Jerusalem that was being built around Washington Square. Christmas was banned as it was in Boston, so it was in Washington Square. The Institutes of Christian Religion, written by John Calvin, were the Bible of Washington Square. Hard work, family values, severe living back to the Bible. And of course, Christmas was banned because there's no biblical justification for December 25th Christmas. And even more so, Jesus never commanded anybody to celebrate his birthday. Well, this idealized image, this puritanical image of Washington Square was enshrined by people like Henry James in his famous book, Washington Square. Edith Wharton's books on Washington Square. 
Here we see a late painting of an idyllic Washington Square by Ferdinand Lundgren, a winter wedding on Washington Square with the Washington Arch in the distance. This was a world created in New York City, a puritanical world, which was, as the Presbyterians believed, going to usher in the second coming. Well, unfortunately, this wonderful world of Washington Square was overtaken by a crop of Civil War millionaires. People like John Jacob Astor, who came to New York, built uh, many buildings and entire city blocks. His goal was to make money. The Brooks Brothers, who had a modest clothing store in Layer, Manhattan, ended up making the uniforms for the Northern Army, and Brooks Brothers even made the suit that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in. The Astors became the richest family in New York. When John Jacob Astor died, in 1848, he was the richest man in America, and his children continued to control the wealth of the Astor family. The Brooks brothers made clothing for the wealthy. Commodore Vanderbilt rose from an obscure farmer in Staten Island to one of the wealthiest men in New York, and we see in the book The First Tycoon. Now, these new rich, so-called the nouveau riche, wanted everybody to know that they had risen from modest beginnings to become the aristocrats of New York City. The Lehman Brothers, Emanuel and Mayer, came, migrated from Germany to the United States, got control of the cotton market after the Civil War, and became the wealthiest Jewish family in New York. These were the first crop of robber barons, the nouveau riche. They wanted the world to know that they were wealthy. They were the type of people who flaunted it in your face with glorious balls, fascinating clothing. And on the right we see the Vanderbilt Row, which stretched from St. Patrick's Cathedral the whole way to Central Park where only Vanderbilts and the descendants of Vanderbilts lived in glorious Fifth Avenue mansions. Now, these people wanted to flaunt their wealth. Washington Square was under siege. The Puritan New Jerusalem, that so many New Yorkers envisaged, was being attacked by people who flaunted their wealth, the very opposite of Weber's wonderful Protestant puritanical uh, businessmen. And on the left we see one of the last of the Fifth Avenue austere brownstones, which were replaced by French-inspired magnificent mansions, both exterior and interior. And so on the right, we see the penetration of French style, French decoration, French living, which, of course, was soundly condemned by the old Dutch, the Presbyterians, and the Evangelical uh, Episcopalians as being sinful. Flaunting wealth was something that one should not do. Remember the Bible story that it is, e that of a, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. So this wonderful world of Washington Square, of Lower Fifth Avenue, puritanical heaven, was under siege by the new Civil War millionaires. Well, where did these new millionaires look? for inspiration on how to flaunt their wealth. Well, they looked to Paris. Under Napoleon III, the city of Paris was transformed from a medieval city into a city of glorious boulevards with matching 
glorious apartment buildings on both sides. On the left here we see the book Paris Reborn, Napoleon III, Baron Haussmann, and the quest to build a modern city. Here we see the Paris Opera in the distance with a glorious boulevard with matching mansions with mansard roofs leading up to it. This was the opulence that the new rich in New York sought to capture. On the right, we see another book, Haussmann, His Life and Times and the Making of Modern Paris. Once again, the opera house, the magnificent palaces, the magnificent squares of Paris. French architecture was eaten up greedily by the Civil War uh, barons, the new rich, and the robber barons who dominated the latter half of the 19th century. They copied the buildings of Paris. In fact, the best of New York architects studied at the Col de Beaux-Arts, where they learned French architecture, and not only the architecture on the exterior, which we see, but everybody wanted to have a bedroom a living room modeled after Versailles, modeled after the palaces of Paris with gilt, with silk wall coverings, elegant furniture, the exact opposite of what the fierce Puritans of Washington Square thought was the truly American. One of the things which was most soundly condemned when it arrived in New York for the very first time was the so-called mansard roof. Mansard roof we see on both pictures, which is a slanted roof as opposed to a pointed roof or a flat roof. Now, Monsieur Monsard, when he invented the mansard roof, it really was a way of evading taxes. If we see at the Ogden um, Gullitz House on Fifth Avenue, uh, we see, which doesn't exist anymore, but we see that he was paying taxes on a three-story house because everything under the mansard roof was not taxed because it was considered an attic. Well, if you look at both of these houses, the Clark Mansion at 5th and 77th, and the uh, Golitz House uh, 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 on also on 5th Avenue, we see that under the mansard roof are probably some of the most elegant rooms in the house. And in the Clark Mansion, there was a magnificent ballroom and theater under the mansard roof, which was not taxed. Now, this was considered devious. It was considered sleazy, something that a good Protestant Bible-reading Protestant would never seek to evade taxes by something so duplicitous. This, they argued, was only something the French would do. Cornelius Vanderbilt, the king of opulent living in New York City. Here on the left we see Cornelius Vanderbilt II's opulent mansion on 57th and 5th, just across, uh, kitty cornered across from the Plaza Hotel. I mean, this is opulent living. Once again, a mansard roof with not only one, but two floors hidden underneath it. At the bottom, we see the breakers and the built more opulent living. This was the exact opposite of what the Federalists, the Founding Fathers believed should be correct American living. The first French flats, today we would call them simply apartments. The French, English still use the word flat. But here on the right we see the very first New York City apartment building named the Stuyvesant of 1869. Once again, right after the Civil War, where so many wealthy people started flocking to living on Fifth Avenue. French flats, when the term was introduced into New York, was a term of derision because good 
people did not live in flats. You had your own house. You maintained your privacy. To live in a flat was considered promiscuous. You, you encountered your neighbors in the hallways and in the early elevators. You shared entrances with other people. So anybody who lived in a French flat was considered socially unacceptable when they were first introduced and they were probably called French flats. Along with French architecture came French entertainment. The very first celebration of Mardi Gras in New York was by Henry Prevort, a good old Dutchman from Fifth Avenue as early as 1840. Well, characteristic of the Mardi Gras, which is Tuesday before the Catholic holiday of Ash Wednesday, which begins the period of Lent, which was supposed to be a period of mourning leading up to Easter. Well, Protestantism rejected Lent. It reje rejected Holy Week. It rejected especially Mardi Gras. And what was characteristic of the French and the Latin celebration of Mardi Gras was a bal masque dressing up in costumes. And this was considered the height of decadence because if a young man had a mask on and a costume, he felt free to give a little kiss to a lady who had a mask, even if they weren't married. It encourages promiscuity. It encouraged taking liberty. And of course, in the eyes of the fierce Protestants, well, you start celebrating Mardi Gras, then next you're going to be having Lent. By God, it was a slippery slope, and pretty soon you'd be converting to Catholicism, the height of non-biblical religion. On the right, we see a famous Bal Masque from um, 1883, where Cornelius Vanderbilt II sent out invitations. And you see them dressed up in the latest in French fashions. So French meant decadent. It meant everything that the good Puritans should not be doing. Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, when it was built in the 1840s, had no church organ. The windows in the church were frosted glass, no images. Well, the French influenced eventually by the late 1800s, even convinced the fierce Scottish Presbyterians of, first, of Fifth Avenue Presbyterian to replace their frosted stained glass windows with magnificent Tiffany windows, which figured, in the eyes of most Presbyterians, graven images of Jesus, of the saints, which was condemned by the more fierce Presbyterians as being another step towards decadent Catholicism when they installed the church organ in the late 1800s and replaced the chanting of biblical songs with the singing of man-made hymns to the accomplishment, accompaniment of musical instruments, this was considered one step further towards hell. So we see French stained glass windows, French organ, French music, even penetrating into the inner sanctum of Presbyterian and Dutch Reformed churches. Even dining started declining by, because of the influence of, France, of the French. On the left, we see the typical American-style dining where you sit around a table, the food is put on the table, and you serve yourself. You see what you're eating, you see how many dishes there are. But the influence of French cuisine, as well as French style of dining, introduced waiters who would pass a, go around and serve you individually. And in fact, the, the pastor of uh, Fifth Avenue Presbyterian said he was once in, invited to a meal uh, where the service was done French style. 
And he said a, a plate would appear, it would be served, but he never knew whether this was the main course, whether there were going to be three more meat dishes, or how long the meal was going to last. He never knew how much to eat of anything. So the French style being served by servants uh, was considered the height of decadence, and it undermined the proud and fierce Christian family values that the Puritans, the Presbyterians, the Dutch Reformed so cherished. Well, of course, with French food, French cuisine, as we say, came all of the terms which were used to describe the French food. A waiter was no longer a waiter, but it became garçon. The person who showed you to the seat was the maître d'. You had the rise of haute cuisine, as opposed to family American meat and potatoes type food. Today we even have the Nouvelle Cuisine, which of course is French inspired. I went to a French cuisine restaurant and everybody said, you make sure you have a good meal before you go because when you go to a Nouvelle Cuisine restaurant, you're going to go out starving to death. You had the introduction of French restaurants. John and Peter Delmonico from Switzerland introduced the menu a la carte, another French term. Charles Ranaufer, the most famous French chef, was brought over by the Delmonicos and a total revolution in dining undermined the traditional family dinner. You had to even speak French in order to know what to order. It was no longer wine or beer, it was vin. You had all of the terminology, all of these new dishes being introduced, which once again was undermining the family. Another evil influence of the French was theater and public entertainment. The Fifth Avenue Opera House, which opened in 1865, once again, the end of the Civil War, where they had not only operas, but theater, based on the French opera comique, where you had music by Offenbach, opera bouffe, frivolous entertainment, no spiritually uplifting values whatsoever. And of course, in every opera house in France and in the United States, the upper rows, the upper balcony was notorious for the number of available young ladies who would promenade in the upper uh, balcony. Once again, the very thing that the Puritans had banned, theater, public entertainment, music, and dancing, entered the city in force following the Civil War, and of course, it came from, of all places, France. Even in the field of, entertain, uh, of painting, rather than, as we see on the right, a good down-to-earth American-style painting, the Hudson River School, uh, Thomas Cole, Frederick Edwin Church, painting real scenes, communing with nature, the, sal the salvific power of nature, a good healthy walk in the woods, was being replaced by this impressionism where you looked at it, you had no idea what you were seeing. There was no spiritually uplifting values in a painting by Claude Monet, um, which of course was French. So it became frivolous, it became entertainment as opposed to good wholesome painting which Americans would appreciate and value. And of course, women's fashions were changing. It was called haute culture. Here we see the various dances and the fashions in the latest French fashions, where American women started going to Paris and bringing in entire boatloads of French fashions, which once again led to frivolity, 
what was being worn this season in Paris. It was no longer good wholesome dress, dressing of good Puritan women, but it was colors, it was expense, where a woman would wear a dress once and then it had to be replaced because she couldn't appear twice in the same um, uh, fashion. Décolleté, which meant having a low neckline. In the middle, we see the more austere Washington Square puritanical Presbyterian type woman, whereas the French started introducing the more um, suggestive fashion, uh, both on the left, the singer sergeant uh, painting, and on the right, where women were elegantly dressed, but totally undressed in areas of certain areas of the body. Once again, this was considered totally scandalous in the better society. But people like the Vanderbilts who rose from nothing to great wealth, they were flaunting their wealth. They were proud of their success and they did it in every way possible. French love was introduced. It was the liberation from proper style of dress, where entire journals, here we see Goody's Ladies Book of 1867, once again, right after the Civil War, showing women how to dress, how to dine, how to entertain, what music to listen to, how to decorate their homes, literally a how-to-do book on how to spend money by people who did not have a large um, uh, knowledge of good taste. And this continued. Here we see the proper Victorian lady, a research paper and tutorial on how to dress as a Victorian lady. So under Victoria, we saw once again a reaction against the more French style. So we see a battle going on in a way between the puritanical English style and Dutch and, Pur and Calvinist style of living and of dressing and the more prop and the more wild French style. France became the center of the emerging pornography business, not only in painting of nudes at École de Beaux-Arts, but the new camera invented by Louis Daguerre in 1844, where we have the name daguerreotypes, where pictures of women in various states of dress and undress became very popular. Once again, all of this uh, decadence emerging from France, Madame Bovary. Uh, by Gustave Flaubert, published illegally in the United States, was sold under the counter in brown paper packages, and it really taught and showed American women how to, as one uh, journalist said, escape the banalities and emptiness of daily life. You could live like a French woman. Terms which were introduced into English, which were considered, in American English, which were considered so inappropriate that they adopted the French word, such as a menage à trois, femme fatale, a French kiss, joie de vivre, ooh la la, faux, as in the sense of a faux fur, once again, phony. Nom de plume, hiding your real identity behind another identity, or even having a soiree. Which, for which there was not an appropriate English word. So we have this growth of what we would consider terrible things coming from France, whether it was the Moulin Rouge of uh, Follet Berger, the Montmartre district, the Can Can, once again, a wild type of dance which would have been totally inappropriate among the pure Calvinists of New York City began seeping into American lifestyle and, in the eyes of many, corrupting the Americans.
Prostitutes. Prostitution in New York in the 1860s. Tend to forget that the Civil War led to an explosion of the prostitution industry, where most of the houses of prostitution were done in the latest French style. Many women would adopt French names. We have here the book Minneapolis Madame. I mean, even the use of the word madam um, pronounced in the French style had its own particular connotation. We see on the bottom, boulangerie, patisserie, debaucherie, meaning typically French. Debauchery was as French as the bread, the baguette was French. We see a gentleman's companion to New York City listing the centers of prostitution, entire district, French imported mail safes. Um, anything coming from France had a less than uh, Christian reputation. The Civil War and its aftermath not only led to a explosion of um, prostitution, but the introduction of uh, uh, abortion clinics. Here we see Madame Restel whose real name was Anne Tro, an English woman who came to New York. But when she opened her first house of, uh, her first abortion clinic, uh, she took a French name. On the right, we see her Fifth Avenue mansion, 1875, Civil War wealth at Fifth Avenue and 52nd Street. And in the bottom, we see the bathtub where she committed suicide because she was not accepted into good French society, or good New York society. Now this complex relationship that Americans have had with Paris, either as a source of elegant, sophisticated living or as a source of depravity, continues until today. The battle goes on. Even the famous World War I song, the 1823 by Eddie Cantor, talking about young soldiers who had gone to Europe and had tasted the delights of Paris. They'll never want to see a rake or a plow back on their Midwestern farm. And who the deuce can parlez-vous a cow? The cows don't even speak French. How are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? Meaning, even going to Paris was going to corrupt the most Bible-reading Christian of farmers from the Midwest. Paris had a more complex relationship because singers like Josephine Baker I remember when I was in Paris, everybody was talking about Josephine Baker, and I never realized that that was plain old American Josephine Baker, who introduced jazz and her own style of dancing into Paris, where she went basically as a cultural refugee. 1925, the height of the Roaring Twenties, she was even too much for New York and spent the rest of her life in Paris. In fact, her adopted son, Jean-Claude Becker, has a wonderful restaurant here in New York City, and it is called, of course, Chez Josephine, serving the best of French food. And so she introduced jazz into Paris, but lived her whole life there as a refugee. Once again, confirming that American notion that Paris is wild. It is decadent, and even sinners from America can find a safe refuge there. During the years of prohibition, Ernest Hemingway wrote, if you are lucky enough to have lived in Paris as a young man, then wherever you go for the rest of your life, it stays with you, for Paris is a movable feast. Other writers who fled to Paris during the years of prohibition and created some of their most interesting work, writings in Paris were Langston Hughes, James Baldwin. James Baldwin's most famous book, Giovanni's Room, was written in Paris about Paris. 
hang out at the Café de Fleur. There we see Ernest Hemingway's wonderful book, A Movable Feast. So once again, confirming that notion that when something was forbidden in America, it was celebrated in Paris. So you could go to the Café de Fleur, sit in a café seat, have a glass of wine or a brandy or something, while Americans were suffering under prohibition. Of course, we all remember one of the most recent scandals was after September 11, when the French refused to, as Americans say, stand by their U.S. allies and join in the wars against uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. The Congress in Washington rebranded French fries as freedom fries. And on the right, we see an actual a menu from the house cafeteria where it has freedom fries. And it says, made uh, in the USA, freedom fries. So here again, we see this complex attitude that Americans have towards Paris. It is a city of decadence. As Ernest Hemingway said, it is a city where once you have experienced it, your eyes will be open forever. You will take it with you forever. You will never go back to the farm to be a puritanical Midwestern farmer or a Washington Square type of Puritan. It will ruin you forever. And so it was both a threat to American values and American way of life, but yet it was a great temptation where you can't imagine a Fifth Avenue without a mansard roof, without the elegance of the mansions of Fifth Avenue, elegant living, going to a restaurant and having your main dish as a plat de jour in any restaurant. So this war over Paris. Is it American? Is it a threat to America? Continues until today. So when I'm in Paris in uh, August for two weeks, I will be seeing this real battle going on. Is Paris the city of love or is it the city of illicit love?